My dear friends, good morning. How are you today? I'm fine. And um, good news to those, um, all of us here in Chino Hills, there is no heat. It's not hot. So, because the reason is, I just got off the phone before the Mass, like 30, 30 minutes before the Mass, from a friend who stays in Nevada, and I tell you something else. And also, my classmate is working in one of the parishes at Phoenix, Arizona. It's something else. So let us give thanks to God for our own level of heat. Anyway, but um, if, you, if you don't mind, please join me to appreciate the Angels Choir. They have been doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thumbs up. Their voices sound like the names they bear, Angel. So I'm so proud of all of you. Keep singing for the Lord, serving the Lord with your beautiful voices. And to your teachers and the pianists and those who train you, God bless you and your families. And then to all our wonderful, beautiful angels here, stay hiding. We need you to come out. Parents, bring your kids. We have more spaces. We have like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. We have like 25 spots for more angels to serve the Lord. Let's appreciate the new angels that will come out very soon. Thank you. So now, next time, we're going to sing. I want that, those seats to be filled up halfway. Can we do that? So bring your kids out. Oh, mom, dad, I, I have a bad voice. Bring the bad voices on. We're going to make your voices look so great and sound so beautiful like the angels' voices. Can we do that? Can I hear a good sort of sounding yes? yes. All right. Let your voices and your words be your bond. Okay. How, what is the time? 11.20. All right. Because it's hot, so I'm not going to talk for a long time. We need to end the mass and go home and cool off. Sounds good? Okay. There's no homily today. All right, let's, let's try five minutes. All right. Today's reflection will be on the topic, and it's like a question. Can God, can God not just make things better? Can God not just make things better before, without bad things happening? Let's put it that way. Can God not just make things better without the bad happening? That's the question of reflection today. This question was a question I posed to myself. And I, sometimes I keep asking myself this question. Because sometimes when I preach to you, I like to come from an existential perspective and realistic stand, standpoint. My own challenges too. The questions I'm asking to God, God, can you not just make things better instead of bad things happening? And I know almost everybody in this church must have asked similar questions. So, quick story before we start. Now, this is a true life story. Not about me, though. It's about a young boy called, okay, let, let's call him Jack as usual, right? I'm not going to tell you the name, the real name. So, Jack, five-year-old Jack was crying and his dad was like, what are, why are you crying, Jack? And, Jack's, and Jack said, I just lost my five, five dollars. So he misplaced his five dollars. And he was crying and crying. You know, his dad was like, okay, that's enough, all right? Here, here it is. Take another five dollars. So he opened his wallet, pulled out five dollars, and replaced Jack's misplaced five dollars. And when the dad did it, he thought that Jack would be happy, right? Because I have given you back your $5. And guess what? Jack's, Jack continued to cry. He cried more. And he's now, what is wrong with you, little man? I just gave you $5. You should be happy. And Jack was like, why should I be happy, dad? I just lost $5. How I wish I didn't lose my $5. I would have had $10 right now. Now, keep that story at the back of your mind. Now, this is a true life story. I didn't make it up. This actually happened at St. Augustine Church in Culver City, one of the parishes where I worked. All right? So, sometimes I remember these stories and, and then I share it. Now, 
It's the second reading. The second reading today says, all things work for good for those who love God. How true is that? Now, realistically, do you believe that? All things work for good for those who love God. We believe because we are Christians. But we do know when we are suffering, that statement, we, we have some question mark around it. How can you tell me that all things work good for you when you go to church every day and try your best every day and things don't really work out for good for you? When you have put in a lot of time at work, five years, ten years, and you're looking for a promotion and someone who just showed up two years ago gets the position before you. When you eat healthy, you are eating all the greens and all the vegetables and every healthy thing on earth, and from nowhere, bam, cancer. But you do have a friend who eats ice cream every day, burger every day, everything that is not healthy, the things that I like to eat. And that person is like 80 years old. You have never tried any kind of drug or cigarettes or any kind of smoking thing. Nothing. From nowhere, lung cancer. But you do have a man or a man or a woman, 75 years old, still enjoying his smoke, enjoying cigarette, healthy. These questions are real. How can you tell me that you are, you that comes here every day to receive the Lord every day, but you still go home and there is a huge fight between you and your, and your wife or between you and your husband? How can all things work for good for you when you love God? Can things just be better without the worst happening? Can God... Not just make things better without the bad happening. Can't we enjoy life without the grace of God coming when we are suffering? Must we suffer before we receive the love of God? Must we struggle before we are successful? Must we go through difficult times before we have stories of glory to tell? Must Jack lose $5 before he could get a new one from his dad? Think about it. All things work for good. Now, I was thinking about it. It was driving me crazy sometimes when I think about this kind of thing. But then it, it, it comes to me, the reality kicks in, that life is not meant to be 100%. God promised us salvation. He said it's going to be well, but he did not say it will not be difficult. The road to salvation is real. The path to salvation is sure. But God did not say it's going to be a smooth ride. In via crucis salutis, by the way of the cross, is salvation. If God himself, in, in the person of his son, had gone through a whole lot of crucibles and pain and suffering before glory, why not us if we have decided to be children of God? So when you suffer, suffer with a Christian sense of faith that the Lord will eventually glorify you. Because if you are in the church right now listening to the sound of my voice, you were chosen by God. And if you were chosen by God, it means that God has called you. And if God has called you, it means that God will justify you. And if you are justified, God will glorify you. So it is a process, four-stage process, being chosen, being called, being justified, and being glorified. So the calling of the chosen, the justification of the called, and the glorification of the justified. That is the process. And this process must account for suffering, for pain, for joy, for glory, for riches, for poverty, disappointment. Engagements, discord, disappointment, anger, hate, joy, love, everything is in this process. Now, if you, as a child of God, open yourself 100% to God as you go through this process, that is where it begins to make sense that eventually, if you wait for the Lord, he will make sure that all things work 
for good for you because you love God. This is called realistic Christian perspective to salvation. The Catholicism, we don't preach only prosperity. God will bless us, yes, but we have also to participate in the sorrowful mystery of God. That is the difference between our church and some other churches that promise people heaven and earth. Tell them there is no suffering. No, there is suffering on earth. The only place there is no suffering is in heaven. Before we die, everybody must go through the four processes of divine mysteries. You must pass through the joyful mystery at one time in your life. You must pass through the glorious mystery at one time in your life. You must also pass through the sorrowful mystery at one time in your life. Also, you must pass through the glorious mystery at, one, at some point in your life. It doesn't matter which one, which one which comes first. Just be ready for all these things to happen in your lifetime. Some of them might happen for a longer time than others, some for a very shorter time. But what we need is to have an open heart to find and search for the Lord. There is one thing that we need. If we ask the Holy Spirit on the right way to search for the Lord, then even if it takes us a long time, even if it takes us a whole long time of sickness to realize the glory of God, even if it takes you a whole long time of unemployment before you realize that lo the, the love of God is real, the main thing is there is a continuous flow of the grace of the God's love upon you. Think about it. The kingdom of God. Just think about that kingdom of God in the gospel. Like a treasure that somebody finds. And what did he do? He sells everything. The Bible did not say a man or a woman. So that's why I was so happy. It's someone. So it's not going to tell me only men must be, the, that the Bible says that God, men, will, male, guys will be prosperous than women. No. The kingdom of God is for everybody, for a man and for a woman. But he said he finds the treasure, which means that treasure was already hidden. The Bible did not tell us how long this guy or this woman was, find, was looking and searching for this treasure. Did you hear the Bible say that? No. So we should put ourselves in that space. This person must have been searching for this treasure, searching for a breakthrough, searching for success, searching for livelihood, searching for a new job, searching for, applicant, for admission to a university for a long time. We could be that person, but eventually he searched and he found it. What did he do? He sold everything he had. So what does that mean? He or she invested her life or his life in that treasure. Same thing with the second parable. The kingdom of God, like a merchant looking for an expensive pearl, and he finds it and sells everything to find it. Search. The underlying theme there is practic uh, practicability of knowledge. And what is that? Practical knowledge is what? Wisdom. You don't learn down, you don't get wisdom from school, you know that. It's a practical knowledge, it's something you learn after school. You go to school, for example, they teach you physics. Let's say, uh, what physics are we going to talk? Let's say Hooke's Law. And they teach you Hooke's Law. And then they te te about, teach you about the string and the strain and the young modulus and all those beautiful things. High schoolers, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yes or no? Just say yes, come on. Yeah. <laughs> right, so they teach you Hooke's Law, right? Just to give you knowledge. But the practicability of Hooke's law is for you to really understand that life is full of strain, str and strain and stress. So the extension of a wire or string is directly proportional to the applied force, provided the elastic limit is not ex exceeded. That is Hooke's law, right? So if you exceed the elastic limit of a strain, or if you stress it out, it slags and sags. So that is what happens to us. That's what Hook's Law was trying to teach you, right? He said yes. So that is what happens in our lifetime. So we have to invest wisdom. 
So we, we get knowledge from school, we come back home, and then we, we build on that. It becomes practical when there is grace of God on the knowledge you received, it becomes wisdom. So we need wisdom in all we do. Solomon did not ask for wisdom in the first reading. Don't get it wrong. He asked for an understanding heart. To be able to judge between the good and the bad. But because he was too open, the Lord actually knew what he needed, not just what he wanted. I know you are so humble, Solomon. You needed an understanding heart, but I will give you wisdom. Because that's what you need, practical knowledge. Matthew chapter 7 from verse 7. Search and you will find. Knock unto the door of the Lord. He will open it up for you. But Jesus did not tell us how long the knocking will be. You can keep knocking for five years, but don't stop. Keep knocking. Keep, keep knocking. Keep searching. Don't stop searching. Don't lose hope. Don't give up. Don't say, I know sometimes we are tired, but don't just give up. Keep going. Keep, keep digging it. Keep doing all you're doing. Because one day, you're going to find your own treasure. You're going to find your own path. You're going to discover your own way. You will know what the Lord wants you to do. If you are still discerning your vocation or what you're going to be in life, keep discerning. Keep working hard. Don't give up. One day, the Spirit of God will make it so clear for you what he wants you to be. And that's when it makes sense to you that all things work good for good for those who love God. Homework. When you go home, I want you to read the Gospel of John, chapter 11, from verse 38 to 44. It's just about the story of Lazarus, right? But what I want you to get from there is, for four days, the sisters and families and friends of Lazarus were suffering, waiting for Jesus. When you suffer, don't suffer alone. Suffer with the mind of faith. Because sometimes the suffering we go through could be orchestrated by God for his own glory and to bring you closer to him. That is the truth. We all know a lot of us sometimes when we struggle, sorry, when God blesses us, we run away. That's the natural thing. When we are, everything is happening well, when there is money in the bank, everything is successful, there is this luxury and indisposition to pray because everything is fine. Bam, something happens negative sickness or disappointment or something bad happens to you. That's when we run to God. Praying every day. Father Uche, pray for me. Father Joseph, pray for me. All the priests on earth, we pray for you. Now when God blesses you, you run away. God is not stupid, brothers and sisters. He's not. The Bible says in the first letter of St. Paul to Corinthians, he says that the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of man. He knows how to bring us closer to him. Sometimes he opens up a little bit of the pathway of suffering for you to realize you are not in charge of your life. He is still in charge. When he arrives, he makes things right. After four days, he arrives at the house of Martha and Mary, the sisters of Lazarus. They were suffering. They, they may have been asking, can God not just make things better without Lazarus, Lazarus dying? But God allowed that for a purpose. If you find yourself in that situation, know that the Lord has chosen you for his glory. Know that the Lord has called you for his glory. Know the Lord will justify you for his glory. And then you will enter the glory of God and be glorified. Just like Jesus, after the suffering on the cross, was glorified unto salvation. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us both now and forever. Amen.